Hello and welcome to this next part in our community garden webinar series. My name is Candace Hart. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension and I work in uh, central Illinois, so the central portion of the state. And I am here today to present um, part one of our gardening safely um, portion of the series. So we are going to talk about um, how we can safely kind of engage youth in the community garden, how we can get seniors involved, and just talk a little bit about overall gardening um, safety uh, and kind of best gardening practices. So that's what we're going to cover today in this section of the series. So we're going to start off talking about youth. I've done a lot of work with youth in a more of a school garden um, setting where the youth are already there, but there's a lot of great benefits, obviously, to getting youth involved in your community gardens as well, especially those, those youth that live nearby in the surrounding community of your community garden. And we all know, of course, there are a lot of great benefits uh, to involving youth into the garden. Um, for one thing, it allows them to get that connection um, with nature that they may not be getting at home or at school. Um, a great thing about a community garden, of course, is that we're growing food. And, that, and this is a great educational tool for, uh, for youth to be able to learn where their youth comes from. They can see that whole process from planting the seed in the ground all the way to harvesting it and maybe uh, even to using it in a recipe and actually cooking it and tasting it. So uh, really that's the best way for them to learn where that food comes from is to grow some of that themselves. Um, there's also a lot of research behind how gardens can help them develop um, some of those fine motor skills in terms of the different practices they're using in the garden. They're going to develop a sense of responsibility, especially if you designate maybe an area of the garden just for youth where they have their own bed or their own little plot that they can grow in. Um, going back to kind of where their food comes from, they're also going to learn some of those more healthy food um, choices because they're going to be more likely to try some of these things if they've been involved in the process. And if they've, if they've seen it planted, they've watered it, they've maintained it, they're a lot more likely to try it uh, once it's actually ready to harvest. So uh, getting more vegetables into the diet and, and getting some of those better food choices started is a great um, benefit. And then, of course, there's a lot of life skills you can learn in the garden, too. Patience, teamwork, uh, a lot of social skills, working together with, with adults as well as other youth. Um, so there are many, many benefits to um, getting some youth involved in your community garden if you don't already have that. So when you are planning that garden, whether you're starting uh, fresh with a new community garden or you already have one started and you're thinking about, okay, maybe I want to get more youth involved, um, there, here's some of the kind of planning things to keep in mind. Uh, now obviously you want to think about your audience. So, um, think about the youth that are going to be coming into that garden and design things in a way, uh, that works for them. So planting things that they like to eat, for example, um, planting some of those really popular vegetables, uh, with kids is a good way to start. And then, as I mentioned before, if you can get them to try some of those more kind of different things that maybe they haven't tried before, uh, that's a great thing to work up towards, too. Um, if there's any way at all, you can have them have some ownership, like I mentioned. So if you can designate a bed or a particular um, three foot by three foot or whatever size it might be, if you can designate that to a particular uh, child, that really helps them take some ownership over the garden. Um, a lot of schools, we do it where a particular class will have a particular bed. You could do it in a number of ways in a community garden, whether it's a particular family, um, uh, siblings have this particular garden. It just depends on your setup. But if there's any way that you can kind of give them a designated spot, um, that's a great thing. Uh, and that goes along with the gardening area, but also the other areas of the garden. So maybe you even have a separate table, a separate kind of picnic table area set up where those kids can come out to the garden and, and study and do other things out in the garden. So just having that kind of designated uh, children's area in the garden is a great idea. Okay. Now, in terms of size um, for a garden, big is obviously not better in a lot of cases, especially if we're working with younger youth. So try to keep things to a, a child's um, scale. Um, if you're doing raised beds, don't make those raised beds too tall. 
um, have them at a shorter height that the youth can access. Maybe don't have them as wide as you normally would so that they can reach towards the middle. Um, and even containers. If you need to start small, start with some containers that the, um, that the youth could actually access. And hosting things at the garden is a great way to get families and kids involved too. So having family nights and cookouts and, and different educational um, opportunities where you're bringing in outside people, um, that's a great way to get families involved to get the kids out in the garden if they hadn't previously. So I mentioned getting youth involved in the planning process, and one of the great ways to do that is to do a, a taste test to see what they want to grow. One of the things we do in classrooms a lot of times is we'll come in early in the season, in, in winter, when it's still winter um, season, and we'll actually sit down with the kids, we'll flip through gardening catalogs, we'll look at seed packets, and we'll just kind of do a query to find out what the kids are interested in growing. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be stuff that we maybe can't grow in a community garden, like a banana plant or, or um, an apple tree, some things that are more long term. Uh, but you're going to find some common themes that will come out of some of the things that these kids want to grow. Maybe they've never even tried them before, um, but they're, they're interested in trying it out. So getting them involved in that initial planning process is, is important so that, again, they take ownership in what they're they're growing in their particular area of the of the garden and a taste test um, just a planning session is a great way to do that some other things to uh, think about when you're trying to get youth engaged um, are just different ways of getting them excited about the garden uh, we do a lot of theme gardens um, for schools but it's great for community gardens too so you can pick a theme for a particular bed a particular container um, that kids would be interested in and that really helps them get excited about the entire process so picking maybe a storybook that they really like and planting plants that would relate to that storybook like Peter Rabbit or Stone Soup that type of thing or even a particular food we do a lot of like salsa gardens pizza gardens taco gardens um, so you can grow things that you could then harvest and then use to create a meal that the kids would be really excited about it. So theme gardens are great. Um, anytime you can create um, different structures is great too. So arbors, um, sunflower uh, teepees, tunnels that you can grow vines on, uh, mazes, all of that. Anytime you have something cool and engaging in the garden um, is going to be great for youth. And keep it colorful, um, too. Obviously, in a community garden, we focus a lot on food production, but there are a lot of great um, just flowering plants and other plants that are really engaging for kids, too. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be something uh, edible. It can also be something that's otherwise engaging, too. Signage is helpful um, for youth as well. So whether you pick a theme garden or not, a, a, a signage that goes along with it would be a great thing. So if you have that pizza garden, have the youth do a, a craft activity where they're making signs so that they can label what the garden is. They can label what each particular uh, plant is. So it's an educational activity for them as well as anybody else who comes and visits the garden. They're going to get to learn what some of those plants are based on what the signage is. In terms of plant selection, I mentioned, um, obviously we grow a lot of edibles in the community garden, but if, when you're thinking about a youth garden, um, maybe think about some of those more interesting uh, varieties. So instead of growing a, a standard red uh, beet, you could, you could consider one of the Chioga striped varieties that has a really cool kind of striping pattern to, to it when you cut it open, or purple carrots instead of your traditional orange carrots, dinosaur gourds, chocolate mints, things that have really interesting um, fragrance to them. Anytime you can have something that's different and you can point it out to the kids, they're going to get pretty excited about it. And as I mentioned, it doesn't all have to be edible. So there's a lot of sensory plants that are, are great for youth as well. So it could be something with fuzzy foliage, uh, like lamb's ear or this um, silver sage here. It could be a, a sensitive plant where when you, the youth would touch the leaves, they fold up. 
So anything that has an interesting texture to it, an interesting smell, color, um, those are also all great ways to engage um, youth into the garden. Safety, of course, is a big uh, consideration, whether it's youth or adults. Everybody should be safe uh, in a community garden. So you may have certain rules that you establish for your particular community garden, but it would be a great idea, obviously, uh, to make it a, a, um, a rule that the youth are occupied with an, by an adult when they're in the garden, whether it's their um, immediate family or if it's uh, the garden manager, someone is there while the youth are at the garden. Obviously, we want to lock away anything that could be dangerous um, to the youth when they're in the garden. So uh, pruners, different garden tools that could be uh, harmful. Any chemicals, of course, need to be uh, locked away so that they're, they're not an easy access to those um, youth. And fencing, um, too. You might consider fencing in that entire garden. Uh, one thing, obviously, for uh, deer and other um, rodents and that type of thing, but also for the safety of the children, especially if you're on a busy street or in a busy area of the community, uh, a fence is a, is, is a great idea as well. So now we're going to move on to um, seniors. So we also do a lot of work with extension with kind of therapeutic gardening, working with some of those uh, senior populations. And gardening is a great kind of therapy tool, a great way um, for seniors to get in uh, engaged, but the accessibility we need to consider when we're considering a senior population. Youth and seniors obviously have a much different, different audience. So if we are considering um, uh, getting seniors involved in the garden, we need to consider what the accessibility needs are and what their abilities are in terms of being able to garden. So we need to take a look at our site, whether it's already created or we're starting fresh, and we need to think about what type of materials the path is created um, from. Is there a slope to the site? Where is it located? Is there handicap parking as an area for them to park? Uh, what are the path widths and what are some of the raised bed options? And we're going to look at those um, here coming up. So any material that we're using for a pathway should be easily accessible with a wheelchair uh, and to avoid kind of tripping hazards. So the smoother material we can have, the better. So bricks or pavers, of course, are great. Uh, if we have the budget to do a concrete walkway or an asphalt walkway, um, even a crushed, a finely crushed stone is a fairly good uh, walkway. We use a lot of mulch for walkways in community gardens, but that's not really our best option if we can avoid it. Um, for a senior population. There's a lot of tripping hazard that could happen there and it's not easy to roll um, a wheelchair on. Okay, And then the path itself to be ADA compliant um, should be at least 36 inches wide, if not wider, if you have the, the option. And there needs to be kind of five foot uh, turnaround areas where a wheelchair could easily uh, be turned around. Okay, so we need to consider um, how the seniors are going to get out to the garden and what type of materials are used in that path. And then we need to think about, okay, well, what kind of beds do we have in, in our particular garden? Uh, raised beds, of course, are a great option for a senior um, population. You can see these uh, beds here are about wheelchair height. So a wheelchair could pull up right next to that bed and they could garden right from their uh, chair. That's really the best way to do it, that you could wheel right up to it. Uh, if raised beds are out of the question, if that's too much to construct, there's a lot of containers as well that can be um, great for that type of access. Right? And going vertical. So even if you do have a ground bed and that's your only option, you can only grow on the ground, um, having different trellises, different type of structures that you could grow plants on, that would elevate things a little bit so that a senior could be able to access those plants as well. So there are many types of containers available that you can choose from. On the top left here, we have um, kind of a fabric go grow bag. These are great, easy to transport, move around. You can reuse them year after year. They're pretty durable. There are a lot of beds that you can construct here in the middle that is really kind of a, just a container that's up off the ground. So you could roll a wheelchair even right underneath the bed and you have a small growing area at the top. 
You can also, a um, lot of different beds you can purchase. So you can purchase, these are kind of horse trough here on the bottom that are a great height for wheelchairs. You could do hanging baskets that could be raised or lowered. So there's really a lot of ways that using containers you can adapt uh, to get to the proper height for uh, a senior to be able to reach and garden. In terms of size, uh, general kind of bed size guidelines are um, about maximum of 60 inches in width. If you're going to be uh, building a raised bed, it should be reachable from all sides, from armpit to, uh, to fingertips if you're doing a one-sided bed. If the uh, gardener is going to be kneeling or seated, 18 to 30 inches is the ideal height. Or you can also have a bed that's taller so that it's used for standing without having to bend. And that would be a 24 to 41 inch height. What's also great to consider are platforms on the sides of the bed. So you can see these top beds here, they have a wider edge so that someone could sit on the edge of that raised bed and garden right from there. Or on this bottom photo here, they've built um, kind of an additional platform there that attaches on. So that way they may not necessarily have to be in their chair. They could sit on the, the edge of the bed and garden that way. Okay, our last section here is just a little bit about kind of gardening safely and body smart gardening, making sure we're, we're taking care of our body and we're not causing more damage to ourselves in that, that act of gardening. So obviously outdoors, we're going to have times where it's very hot out in the garden. So avoiding heat stroke, sunstroke is, is something we need to think about. So making sure that when we are out in the garden, we're drinking plenty of water or um, sports drinks. We're avoiding alcohol and caffeine products. We're taking frequent breaks. Uh, if it is very hot, we're misting ourselves with the garden hose, with a bottle to keep us cooler. And if at all possible, avoid those hottest parts of the day. So work in the garden early in the morning, um, in the evening when the temperatures are cooler. We also want to think about a sunscreen. Sunscreen and bug protection are, are very important. And of course, the general rule of thumb, you want to apply that 30 minutes before you go outside. And ideally, it should be kind of an SPF 30 or greater. Clothing is important to consider, uh, too. We obviously want to make sure we're, we're safe in the type of clothing that we're wearing out in the garden. So we want to have shoes that are uh, suited for the job. Closed toe, they're sturdy in case we were to drop, uh, drop things while we're working. We want to protect our, our head from the sun, so a wide-brimmed hat uh, is a great thing to garden with. And then, of course, gloves. We want tight-fitting gloves that allow us for our finger and hand movement, uh, but are still tight enough that they're not going to get caught on um, different machinery and things. So once you're uh, correctly outfitted to head outside, we also want to talk about how to avoid injury uh, with our gardening. Um, so one of those is kind of proper technique and using the tools. So one of the big things is that we don't necessarily want to reach towards a shore. Towards a chore. You want to keep that center of gravity and your movement close to your body. So if you're trying to, to hoe a weed, move closer to that weed so that you're not having to bend over and, and use that tool to reach towards you. So move to the chore, don't um, bring the chore to you. You also want to try to keep those arms close to your body, and especially if you're raking, uh, pull that rake or that hoe towards you, trying to keep the back straight. As much as you can keep the back straight, you're going to avoid injury that way. So if you feel like you need to bend over uh, to get closer to something, to reach whatever task you're trying to do, instead of trying to bend over, move your steps a little bit forward so you can move closer to that chore. We also want to try to avoid bending that back as much as possible. So don't bend that back, bend at the knees. So if that means you need to kneel uh, to do a particular task or you need to bring out a garden to a stool, uh, whatever kind of equipment it takes uh, to help you avoid bending that back is going to avoid some of those um, back breaking injuries that we can get out in the garden. 
So in review, if we're thinking about gardening safely and making sure we're avoiding injuries, we want to think about how we're dressed before we go out in the garden. Are we drinking enough fluid? Are we taking frequent breaks? Um, are we avoiding kind of doing the same activity over and over and using the right tools uh, for the job? And are we kind of constructing that garden in a way that we can limit our bending? So raised beds, containers. So just some of those things to think about when we're designing the garden and we're we're planning kind of um, getting out there in the garden, some of those safety things we want to think about. So in conclusion, if you ever need more information about gardening, please check out our horticulture website with University of Illinois Extension that we have web pages on a variety of different topics. And you can also use the search bar to uh, search for whatever topic you might be uh, be looking for. So that wraps up part one of our gardening um, safely portion of the community garden series. So stay tuned for um, part two and uh, thank you for joining us.